Hello, everyone. I'm Laura Cutler, Managing Director of the Center for Israel Studies, now the Meltzer Schwartzberg Center for Israel Studies. When Michael Brenner proposed that this year's Meltzer Trone Conference be on divisions in Israeli society and efforts to bridge those divisions, I immediately thought of a fantastic presentation that I saw at this year's Association for Israel Studies Conference at New York University. Uh, the presentation by Donna Blander, head of research at the Israel Democracy Institute, was on changes seen in the last decades in the Israeli Democracy, democracy Index. I found some of her um, findings surprising and thought how the divisions in Israeli society figure into the current political situation would be a great focus for a keynote. <clears throat> The Israeli Democracy Index is an annual survey of public opinion on the state of Israeli democracy, including trust in government institutions, identification with the state, the Jewish and democratic characters of the state, politics and political activism, economic attitudes, as well as, as an evaluation of Israel's standing in the democratic world as measured by a number of international indices. Recognizing the importance of a substantive and stable democracy in Israel, the index is used to identify areas that need to be improved and enhanced in Israel's democratic culture and regime. The index is presented to the president of the state of Israel at an annual ceremony every year at his residence. So um, I am really personally very pleased that Donna agreed to come to present some of IDI's research findings with us. Um, she told me she's been at IDI for over two decades. Um, her own research focuses on Israeli politics, referendums, private legislation, civic participation, and state and parliamentary investigative committees. But as I said, she oversees all of the um, research at the Israel Democracy Institute, which is really a very well-respected think tank in Israel. And she told me that she loves that variety of getting to do not just her own research, but to see others' research. So I want to um, invite Donna to come. And thank you so much for coming. I want to uh, thank you for the invitation. And I'll start um, immediately. I would like to introduce you to a new disorder. I call this order democratic attention disorder. <laughs> I'm going to show you a short video. So it's a very famous selective attention test. OK? Thank you. OK. Um, you cannot see you. But they ask you to count the passes of the players in white. How many passes are for the players in white? Okay. Okay. There. So I want to use this selective uh, attention test to diagnose what I call a democratic attention disorder. I think that while we were, many of us, were busy in the, what we can call the bright side of democracy, which is in this movie counting the passes of the white players, kind of we were busy in liberal discourse on human rights and what Engelhardt called post-materialistic values of self-expression, autonomy, freedom of speech, gender equality, LGBTQ rights, environmentalism, while we were busy doing that, other groups in society played another game. Some of them were neglected or excluded or wished to stay out of the liberal democratic game. These are, if you notice, the players in black in this uh, movie, whom we didn't count now, and maybe we didn't count. And then there is the gorilla, if you've noticed. And I think each democracy has its own gorilla. Um, the, the phenomenon that went unnoticed, but grew to sizes that cannot be ignored anymore. Um, or the return of the repressed, as uh, you call it in, in psychoanalysis. It might be inequality, immigration, it might be occupation, or it might be the values, conservative values, 
or it might be racism. Each democracy has its own gorilla. And also, as we see now, the climate change can also become a huge gorilla that will affect uh, the lives of all of us. And now I think you can say that we've wakened up to the reality in which there is no doubt democracy is in real danger. So as you can see, in recent years, many scholars have described the symptoms of democratic backsliding, as well as the rise of authoritative populism. Although this phenomenon takes place in really very different democracies, very stable and robust democracies with robust dem democratic political culture, as well as new democracies like uh, uh, Hungary and Poland, one can identify, even though it happens in really very different places, you can identify a playbook that, of processes that actually undermine the democratic political order and turns it into what uh, I call, I, I think I, I've invented the, uh, the, the, the word hollow democracy, um, which is a skeleton of democracy in which the only principle that matters is majority rule and in which the executive branch, the government, controls the other authorities. The court is deprived of its uh, independence and the parliament becomes only a rubber stamp. And I want to stress what's so uh, special about the processes that we see. One thing is what uh, Ziblatt and Levitsky, Levitsky and Ziblatt say. If you read the last sentence, they describe how democracies used to die in the past with tanks on the street, but today you don't need tanks on the street. It doesn't have to be in the middle of the night. It's in broad daylight and it happens. Democratic background today begins at the loot box. So democracy dies at the hands of those who claim they promote democracy. And I think this is what makes it so difficult to fight this phenomenon. Because when you use democracy against itself, democracy has its own uh, self-demolition uh, um, um, means. If you use democracy uh, discourse to undermine democracy, it's really difficult uh, to know how, how really to deal with this. Because, for example, in Israel, those who promote the judicial overhaul, they say, they don't say, you know what, leave us alone, we don't want democracy, uh, Montesquieu can um, roll in his grave, we don't care about separation of powers. No, they say we want to return the separation of powers. The court has too much uh, power, so now we're making it uh, more dependent in, in, uh, the, in the politicians, so it will be more moderate. So they use the languages of democracy. They don't say we don't want democracy anymore. Even uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary doesn't say we don't want to be democracy anymore because he takes only one part of democracy, which is majority rule. And he doesn't take the, he says uh, we are illiberal democracy, but there is no such thing because democracy is, um, has a, uh, um, um, a core of values that cannot, um, that you, you must respect, which is equality, freedom, and human dignity. And once uh, you undermine these values, you cannot say that you are a democracy, even if you use the language of a majority rule. Another thing that is special about this democratic backsliding is that it's incremental death, step by step. Uh, in a cumulative way, even sometimes unnoticed. So first you have some nominations that are political, a state controller, attorney general, other safeguards. Then you have the judges. You want to have more uh, uh, political nomination of the judges. Uh, then you have regulation on media. Then you change the electoral laws. And we see it in Israel. We have a package of step-by-step reasonability doctrine, selection of judges committee, override clause. And so we, sometimes you don't feel that your democracy died. You wake up and you realize that this is what happened. So 
I want to show you shortly how this playbook, what's written in this playbook that is on the uh, uh, tables of many leaders uh, around the world. Um, you can see it's, you can look at it in like in three spheres uh, or three clusters. One is the institutional and political processes. So I talked about the tyranny of the executive turning all the other um, authorities uh, dependent in the executive. Uh, weakness and dependence of the guardians of democracy. Uh, in Israel, we see it trying to make uh, the attorney general weaker. They haven't succeeded in that. Um, but there is a chilling effect of, uh, of uh, uh, this uh, terror against the guardians of democracy. Of course, tyranny of the majority. You, uh, the talk will talked about the tyranny of the majority. And it's true that it's, the, um, it's, it's how democracy uh, acts against itself. Another important thing is that you do delegitimation of opposition. And it has to do with the voice of the people. Uh, Jan Werner Muller says that this is the most prominent uh, attribute of populism, that you don't let other voices to be heard. But it's not just you, you make them silence. They become illegitimate. Everything that is not the voice of the people, and only the leaders uh, can uh, know what is the voice of the people. Another thing is anti-democratic legislation, which is the legislation against the core uh, values of democracy. And some people say, how can a legislation be undemocratic if it is accepted in a democratic way? Well, it can be, because democracy is not only a procedure. It's an essential thing. If you uh, act with majority rule against the core values of democracy, then it's non-democratic. Um, another thing that we see, we see disrespect for norms. Um, you, what you see in the discourse of those who threat democracy is that they don't respect anything that is not written. What's written, they change, and what's not written, they do not respect, because they say the law uh, does not forbid it, so we can do it. For example, now we have the discussion in Israel about the seniority uh, um, um, uh, rule. I mean, in Israel, the most veteran judge is to become the chief uh, justice of the Supreme Court. And now it is being uh, threatened. It's not a written law. It's true. It's not written in any law. It's just a norm. But norms are part of the fabric of democracy. If you disregard the norms, for example, like hypothetical, if you're a prime minister and you will stand on trial, I mean, we had this norm in Israel. Unfortunately, we have a previous prime minister that was under investigation, and he resigned, Olmert. He resigned. So it was a norm. It's not written in the law. I just want to warn you that it doesn't, it's not written also in the American Constitution. So you can also have uh, a president on trial. Um, OK. So the other uh, sphere is society. I call it society versus itself. This is what, if you want to understand what populism is, the only thing you, know, you need to know is versus, against. It's always anti-something. So social polarization, and I will show in, in my lecture, I will show all these things, how they happen in Israel. Um, so social polarization, it's always us versus them. This is the power of populism. Freud said long ago uh, in the um, uh, analysis, uh, group uh, psychology and the analysis of ego, that what makes stronger the group is hatred towards another group. So it's always the common people versus the elite. In Israel, we saw it in uh, this discourse of second grade uh, citizens against those pilots and high tech elite. Uh, we see that there is, what I said, anti pluralism. There's only one voice of the people, and only the leaders make this voice. Whoever makes another voice, and we will see examples from civil society organization, for example, they are, they are being delegitimized. Not you don't agree with them. They are not legitimate. And of course, hatred of the other, there's always a scapegoat. There's always a group that you identify. And in Israel, it's easy, because we have the Arab minority. 
and in extreme cases, you get to violence within society. Another sphere is, I call it spheres of freedom. Uh, you start having legislation and especially chilling effect which means that it's not legislated, but the atmosphere is that you'd better be silent. So limits on freedom, uh, speech, association, now we see limits on protest, and limits on what I call free spirit institutions, which means the civil society, media, art, and academia. And in Israel, we have examples. They don't uh, want you to be um, creative if you're an artist, because you need to uh, show the voice of the people. Yeah? You need to be uh, uh, loyal, and not if it's uh, public uh, uh, offices, they need to be loyal, not professional. And if it's artists, they need to be loyal in order to get funding. Or if you're a professor and you, uh, and you say what you think, then be careful, because you might be deprived of a research budget and prizes. We had a, an example of Oded Goldreich. He won the Israel Prize for Mathematics, and it was uh, taken away from him, and Bagat, the High Court of Justice, uh, uh, said that he should accept it because he was involved in a um, leftist uh, protest. So before I uh, dwell into the data about uh, Israel democracy, I want to say... Uh, Laura kindly gave, uh, gave my presentation a title because she saw um, uh, my presentation at uh, the ACE uh, conference. But I want to say, I don't think what we're experiencing now is a political crisis in the usual way. I want to give an example from, um, uh, from uh, football. I play uh, what you call uh, uh, soccer. Yeah, I, I, I play football. You can uh, see my uh, name in the Israeli uh, Association of uh, Football. Then you can discover that it's my birthday today. <laughs> uh, so it's always useful. Uh, if you can uh, explain something by uh, football, then it's, uh, then it's really a good uh, example. In, in political discourse, we have a team against another team. Okay, some of us want this team to... to win and the others want the other team to win. That's okay, that's politics. But now what we're experiencing in Israel is that one team that is leading the game at the moment, because in the democratic game, you can, if you can imagine that you will always win the game, then you don't live in a democracy or you don't play football. Because you can always, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. But this team that leads, and it doesn't lead uh, the, 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 the game in very, I mean, it's 64. In Israel, minimal winning coalition in Israel are 61. In the past, 64, coalition of 64 members of the Knesset, we called it a narrow coalition. And now it's as if it's a huge majority. It's only 64, it's a majority. But in Israel, we used to have very large coalitions of 80 MKs, and, and we were very inclusive. The politics was very inclusive. Uh, so what we experience now in this game is that the team that leads at the moment in the game, 4-0, right? So it wants to change the rules of the game. And it's not as if we will argue. We both were from different uh, teams, and we say there was a penalty or there was not a penalty. No, it's not that. What they're saying is, from now on, there will not be a penalty. And you know what? Just to make sure, we will choose the judge, the referee. OK? So I think that what we're experiencing now is really a different, um, a different thing. And another, I think, proof that it's not a usual political uh, uh, discourse and uh, conflict that we are witnessing. If you noticed, suddenly we see new players in the public sphere. We see um, business owners. We see high-tech companies. We see Israel Medical Association getting into this political crisis. If it was a political crisis, all those former heads of Shabak and Mossad and uh, former judges 
that you never hear them on, on political discourse. This is the norm. After you quit from being a judge, you don't, you usually don't get involved in political debates. So this is not a political debate. This is why all these non-political uh, players are playing in the game, because they know that it's not who will win the game. It's if we will have the same game that is called democracy. And I want to say like a personal note in this. Uh, oh, I, I, I should have shown this. I want to say, <laughs> say like a personal uh, note. Um, this is uh, the book uh, Professor Yitzhak Galnour and I, we've published in Hebrew in 2013, then at Cambridge in 2018, and in 2021, I think, in Arabic. So in an ACE conference in 2012, before uh, the book was published, we, uh, we called it the Israeli Democratic Paradox. And this is the original thing that we've written in the slide in 2012. And this is actually the rationale of this book, this very, very heavy book. I wanted to bring you more as a present, but it was overweight, so it's the <laughs> so I will give it to you. I hope you won't put it in the history shelves uh, of Israel as a democracy. We were saying that while the institutional framework remained almost the same since the early days, and the rules of the game have been generally observed, the values underlying them have not become axiomatic, and symptoms of anti-politics and anti-democracy are spreading. So when we analyzed this paradox, we thought that what needs to be happened, and this was also the rationale of Professor, the late Professor Asher Arian that started the Israel Democracy Index, is how can a democracy become more democratic? So we thought that the, the paradox will be resolved by internalizing democratic political culture. But what we experience now is that the opposite has happened. The institutional framework and the keeping of the rules of the game, this is what is broken now. And this is why I think it's not political in the sense that we are used to think about it. OK. Um, so as you will see in the um, oh. OK, everybody thinks that Israel is in danger. It's from uh, the New York Times. So OK, Israeli thinks the majority of Israelis, and this is all from the Israel Democracy Index. It is, uh, uh, in the, uh, it is done in the Viterbi Center. Previously, it's called the Gutman Center at the Israel Democracy Institute, headed by Professor Tamar Herman. In the past, Professor Asher Ariane has started this index, and it is since 2003. It started in 2003, um, and I've been there when it, it was born because I'm 27 years at the IDI, actually. Um, so as you can see here, the majority of Israelis think that Israel democracy is in danger. But as you will see again and again and again, not everybody are worried in the same uh, way and not for the same reasons. So as you can see, 80% of the left are worried, 74% of the center, and 30% of the right. And you can see that the right were more worried about democracy when there was a, uh, the government of uh, Bennett, the, what you call the change government, and of course now the left. But I think we need to keep in mind something. It's not when we look at this. Look on the left, on the small so it's, it's on the left, and it's only what's left of the Israeli left, nothing. 11% of Jews in Israel, these uh, labels of right, uh, center, and left, they don't apply to the Arab um, uh, public of Israel because they vote for Arab parties mainly. So they don't uh, identify themselves as center or right or left. They don't see themselves as part of these camps. So only 11% say that they are. So from this 11%, 80% of the 11% are worried. So it's only a minority. And also 24% on the center. So it's 74% of this 24%. And the majority is almost 2 thirds of Israelis, of Jews in Israel, say that they are on the right. So this is a thing to remember when you look at uh, um, the other figures. 
And I just want to tell you about uh, public po polls. You can uh, learn from them, not only from the answers that people give, but from the questions that are being asked along the years. And so in the past, we used to ask this naive question that says democracy is the best form of government. And we used to get like a really, uh, we thought this was a decline. 77% say that it's uh, the best form of, uh, of uh, government. But now we won't ask this question. Since 2017, we ask this question. Is Israel democracy in danger? So we see from the wording, uh, I call this a reflective level of analyzing um, 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 public polls. So we see that the, the question has changed. Okay, so one thing that Yasha Monk and Foa say about the decline of democracy is that the first thing you see is decline in trust in institutions. Um, this, I don't like this. <laughs> okay. So um, we see it in Israel, but, and now remember, you remember the paradox I was talking about? Now you will see. Israel was not a perfect democracy before this government, as was said here before. We didn't have a, a democratic political culture. And the, for example, the uh, trust in institution was always not very high. And still, in 2022, which is the last uh, Israel, uh, Israel index, um, we had the lowest ever um, levels of trust in institutions. But you can always see a pattern in Israel. What we call a statism institution, like Mamlachtiim, they always get the highest trust, those on the, on the left. The IDF, the president, and Supreme Court. This is only the data of the Jewish uh, public. The, uh, the Arab uh, public in Israel is lower in trust in, every, uh, in everything. So it's... It's true for the Jewish that the IDF is always uh, the highest. It's not true for the public, uh, the Arab public, uh, naturally. The president of Israel and the Supreme Court. And then you have those that the public can influence, that the public can choose or can be a part of, the political parties, the Knesset, the government. So we see that there is really a, a decline. So we, we can mark... This. In Israel, we have a decline in trust in institutions. Um, what else you can see, and this is also a, a sign of populism, is yearning for a strong leader. But pay attention again. It hasn't started yesterday. This is the data. It starts in 2003 because this is when the Israeli Democracy Index started. But it's not, it hasn't changed that much along the years. It looks like this because they changed the wording of the question. But Israel has, has always had authoritative tendencies. You know, you don't need all these parties, all these uh, 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 public opinion, media, Knesset. All we need is a strong leader. But pay attention. The thing with the political culture hasn't started yesterday. And this also, now we move to the second cluster, okay, of society. Israeli society has always been a deeply divided society. Um, it's, it has national cleavage, religious, ideological. Lisa and Horowitz in uh, Trouble in Utopia, they describe the multi-rift structure of the society. And what's special in Israel is that the cleavages overlap. Uh, if you are one thing, if you are religious, then you are also on the right wing uh, side of the political map. But here you will see something that is really, here you can see how politics can change the tensions within society and make it more divided. Uh, Nancy Bermio has a book saying, uh, it's called uh, Ordinary People in Extraordinary Times. And she says that the main, she doesn't say it in these words, but I rephrase it, that the, the, the main cause of death of democracy is polarization. And here you can see, and also uh, Sartori, Giovanni Sartori, which is a political scientist, 
the most benefit you get, electoral benefits you can get, you get it from social polarization. You can utilize it uh, for uh, electoral benefits. Here you can see that, in, and it goes back, that usually in the majority of years of the uh, Israel Democrat, uh, Democracy Index, and even before, we have data from before, the most intense uh, gap or the most intense uh, rift was between the national rift, between Arabs and Jews. You see 47% thought it was the most, uh, uh, um, the highest level, has the highest level of tension, and then in 2016, 50%, but then you see gradually that it is changing. I mean, social changes don't happen so fast. How come in January 23, almost 50% say this is the Jewish? Um, among the Arabs, they always say that the national uh, cleavage is the most, uh, uh, has the most tension. But in January 23, we see 48% of the Jewish public saying that the right-left cleavage is the worst. How come 10 years before it was only 9%? The society hasn't changed. We've been always a divided society. So this is what I call the polarization effect. It's not in, it's not in reality. In, it's not demography even. It's only the influence of the politics on the way uh, the society um, the way the different groups in society feel the tension. And, okay, I think this is the most interesting uh, slide here. Um, what else you can see here? You, you can see the purple. This is the Mizrahim and Ashkenazim that will be discussed later today. It is really surprising that in the political discourse, it's like... Um, um, it's like a fuel for the the um, for the the, the political uh, dis discourse, and you can hear people in the demonstration saying we are second grade uh, citizens. That usually the Arabs were the second grade citizens, but now Mizrahim call themselves were second grade citizens. But when you ask people, they don't think that Mizrahi and Ashkenazi is such a prominent cleavage in Israeli society. So this is kind of a, a, a riddle. And what you can say is that it's being used to polarize the society. So in Israel, as I said, tell me who you are. I'll tell you what you think. Actually, we don't need to do the Israeli Democracy Index. If we have the self-identification or demography, we can say what will be the views of a person in a certain uh, question. So. This is you saw before the, um, the, the, the camps of left, center, and right. The society hasn't changed so much. On the right, you see, these are the real uh, numbers of people, of how they, uh, when uh, the, um, the, I mean, the center board of statistics ask people, how do you define yourself? It's self-definition. This hasn't changed much. But what you can see here, is that if you want to bet on one's um, attitudes, if you know that he's a Haredi, then be sure that he will be on the right. National religious, on the right. Traditional, mostly on the right. And secular, as you see, they are uh, divided. And now I want to show you recent uh, data about what's called the reasonableness law. In Israel, you always call the laws in the opposite of their meaning. Reasonableness law says there won't be reasonableness anymore. Nakba law says you're not allowed to commemorate the Dakba. So it's always called in a, in a negative way. So if you look at this, first you see that the majority, this is the whole public, including the Arabs. 60% say that it is bad for Israeli democracy, 35% say that it is good. You know what's missing here? Those who say, I don't know. Usually we have higher percentages of those who don't know. But once you don't have, this means that there is a really serious civic involvement. People know what's the issue we are discussing. So not many people said, we don't know what it is. 
And those people, like if you would ask them like a year ago, what is reasonableness? They wouldn't know what you're asking. But now everybody knows. And here you can see the divisions that you always see. If you uh, voted for a party in the coalition, so 72% says it's good for democracy, the, the omitting of the reasonableness uh, from uh, uh, the High Court of Justice can say that something is not reasonable. Uh, the, the Arabs, only a minority think it's good, and the Jews, only 40%. And then, of course, you see, it's, it's really uh, very uh, uh, systematic if you're on the right, if you're on the center, if you're on the left. So this is how today, so it's political in the sense that there is a difference between the camps, but it's not political in the sense that democracy, you don't debate if whether you want to be a democracy or not a democracy in a democratic uh, means. Because democracy, we, we know it from the past, that we need to defend democracy from itself. Democracy is its worst enemy. So. OK. And now I want to move for, to the other thing. We said polarization of society. This is one of the, you remember, the cluster of society. Another thing is to find an other. Always have an other, because this is what will make your inner solidarity uh, stronger. And in Israel, of course, it is not new. And uh, our um, Arab uh, citizens of Israel, those who spoke here, of course, they, they, uh, they live this. Uh, reality. And this is not a secret. It's been in the Israeli Democracy Index for years, right? That the majority of the right, uh, actually it's the majority of the public, of the uh, Jewish public in Israel, think that, it, that uh, uh, Israelis should have uh, more rights, that Jewish citizens should have more rights than non-Jewish citizens. So I don't want to say the word the A word, the apartheid word, but it's, you know, it's a reality in Israel. There is no robust democratic political culture in Israel, and there hasn't been. Don't be nostalgic. But um, I think that today we don't have those institutions and rules of the game that preserved Israel somehow as a democracy. Um, I call it the blind spot of Israel democracy, of course. You see 83 of uh, the Arabs think they are being discriminated, while only a third of the Jews think they are. So it's, it's really a blind uh, spot. And this is, um, I always sh show this figure, because this is the largest consensus in the Israel Democracy uh, Index ever, this question, that decisions, crucial decisions, um, on issues of peace and security should be made by a Jewish majority. It's always above 60, 59 to 83 percent of the Jews thinking. And now you would say, okay, you know, it's security, it's uh, peace. Maybe we know what the Arabs think, so this is why they want to exclude them. It's not true. We ask about economic and social issues as well, and there's also, also this pattern of majority of Jews that think that Arabs should not be a part of decision-making processes in Israel. Uh, although, as Muhammad uh, said before, uh, there is a larger um, support for uh, Arab parties within the coalition. Um, OK, and now I move to the third sphere of uh, spheres of freedom. Um, Civil society organizations. Uh, this is, you can see it in, all around uh, the world. Uh, you see it in Hungary. Two minutes? You see it in Hungary and you see it in other uh, places that civil society organizations uh, are being restrained. And how do they do it? Again, with the language of democracy. In the name of transparency, we cannot allow organization to get money from certain sources. So in Hungary, it was a Central uh, a European University that had to move uh, out of the country uh, because they didn't allow them to get money from uh, what they call the Soros Empire. Um, OK, so 
this is uh, um, what you see here. You see that there is a rise in uh, Jews that think that those uh, civil society organizations of human rights are a danger to, to the state. There was a campaign against them. There was a campaign against uh, uh, breaking the silence. Um, and it, it works. It works. People start to believe that they are doing damage to Israel. Um, so we see that Israeli democracy was not like a perfect democracy, and now it's under threat. But what's under threat now is the institutional framework and the respect for the rules of the game. So I don't know if Laura told us, but we all end with kind of signs of hope. So is there a, a, a future for Israel democracy? I will show some signs of hope. First of all, when you take all the democratic index, indexes, the one that Israel, the only one that Israel is in the top, like you see, 100, you see the blue, the blue spot there, it's Israel, uh, is political participation. We went to five consecutive uh, electoral uh, campaigns uh, in three years, and look, 70% of the population uh, uh, voted of the Jewish, uh, this is the total. Uh, but there is a gap uh, in, uh, in voting in Israel. Um, the Arabs vote less. I wish they would vote more, although I understand why they vote less. But I think if you ask me what's the game changer, what's the tie break in Israeli politics, it's this 50% of Arabs that didn't show up to the Balut box. Maybe our democracy will start at the Balut box if uh, the Arabs will participate uh, more. And another sign of hope is what we see uh, here. You see 21% on March 2023 said they participated in protest. It's, the, I think, the highest in the world. And of course, the left, what's left of the left, is uh, um, participating in the demonstration, but not only the left, even almost a third of the center joined the demonstrations. And another sign of hope is that I think that the Israeli public is more democratic than its representatives. And here I brought an example from the Peace Index. Uh, now we call it the, the Israeli voice. Um, how many uh, Jews, Jewish public, uh, agreed that the value of equality that is mentioned in the Declaration of Independence should appear in the basic law of the nation state. It doesn't appear. But you see that there is a majority, even among the right, 50% of them said that it should have been within this law. So it's not the public. You know, it's always in democracy. Uh, everybody thinks that the threat for democracy comes from the mass. Uh, Appleton Plato didn't, didn't like democracy because of that, because of the power of the masses. But it's not the masses. It's the political elite, because the public is much more tolerant and democratic than its representatives. And I want to show, really, it's, it's, it's a public opinion pool. You know? It's a, a representative sample of the whole public, not just those who make the noise. So this is what, what you can see here, is that a majority agrees that the Supreme Court have the power to overturn laws passed by the Knesset if they contradict democratic principles. And you see here that the, still there is a majority uh, of Jews that think that he, he should have, it should have the power. Uh, of course, more on the left than in the center and in the right. And Another thing that you can see, that there is almost no difference in uh, public trust in the Supreme Court, even with this uh, protest wave against uh, um, protest for uh, the High Court of Justice and against it. So you can see that it's, it stayed almost the same. Um, and what we were talking about before, how can we amend this? There is hope, because a majority agree that the Knesset should work to enact a broadly accepted constitution, and it, it will start from the Declaration of uh, Independence. 
And also in the reasonableness law, we also ask in the Israeli voice, this is a monthly uh, uh, survey that we have. You can find it all on uh, our, uh, there's a special website, and it also appears in English every month, so you can have the latest uh, data. Um, so the majority even from the coalition party voters and the opposition party voters think that it was desirable to reach some kind of compromise. And maybe, I, I hope I'm not, uh, still, violence is illegitimate in politics. I mean, this is the heritage we have, unfortunately, from the uh, murder of Itzhak, Prime Minister Itzhak Rabin, but still, the majority thinks that it's not legitimate to be violent. I hope it's not just a matter of time. And you see, most of Israelis want to go on living in Israel, even if they would be offered um, uh, citizenship in another. I guess that the next uh, Israeli uh, dem democracy, in Israel democracy index will, have, uh, will change a bit, especially in the young, younger groups of ages. Uh, but uh, I hope it would not be. Uh... And lastly, I asked uh, Bard uh, and ChatGPT about the future. Is I asked, is Israel democracy under a grave danger? This is the question that we ask in the survey. And it says, if the current trends continue, it is possible that Israel could become a non-democratic state in the future. I hope the AI is mistaken. Thank you. So um, sorry some of our students had to leave for um, classes, but um, we'd love to entertain questions from the audience and particularly our students. So if you have questions, you can line up at the microphone. My name is Gabby. I'm a junior. Um, so you said that uh, the Israeli government is limiting uh, the current protests that have been going on. But uh, from what I've seen on social media, and um, I was there for a little bit um, over the summer, I haven't seen the way that protests have been limited, um, at least from a, like an outsider looking in. So I was wondering um, if you could uh, expand on what you said, um, because it must not be apparent like on the, from the media and like even protesting in the international airport, like that has been happening and they've been doing it for 35, 36 weeks now straight. Um, so yeah, I was a little curious about that. Okay, so um, I think that uh, your impression was Right, it's true that Israel is still a democracy. And I think that um, I remember for chem chemistry lessons that you have a lacmus paper that if you touch an acid or a, then it changes its color. So I think that as long as there is a protest, this is the lacmus paper of democracy. As long as we ca people can go out to the streets and protest, then it means that you live in a democracy. So it's true that on this level, we have a weekly uh, demonstration, and they are uh, permitted by the, the police. They're arranged. I go usually to a place called the uh, Kalkul Junction, and actually the police allow the, demon the, the demonstrators to block the road for 15 minutes from 8 till 8.15, and then we move. So there is, I mean, it's a very usually silent um, uh, demonstration. But once they become a little bit more of an interruption to the public order, then there is a kind of non-proportional um, um, reaction from the side of the police that is doing really, even under Ben Gvir, it, the, the police itself, it's, it's supposed to be kind of independent from the political um, uh, from the minister. Uh, it does a good job in protecting the demonstrators. And yet, the heads of the protests um, are being investigated, and it's kind of a chilling effect. They are just being called for questioning. 
So it means lower your profile. So it starts uh, with that, and I think that for now it's true that it is still, we are still in a good uh, condition. Because I think that the, the demonstrations are so uh, large scale demonstrations that they cannot be turned off easily. Do you have uh, any explanation or theory about why in, back in 2011, just as many Arabs as Jews found civil societies to be dangerous to Israel? It's 51% of Arabs and 50% of Jews. I must, I must say, um, I mean, public uh, opinion polls are not uh, always, uh, you cannot always explain your uh, data. Uh, it might, and, and in Arab uh, public especially, although we ask in Arabic, but there is still kind of what are we expected to answer sometimes. So it might be that. and. Uh, I really, I don't know the answer. I can just uh, assume. Hi. Um, you're a lot closer to what's going on in Israel than we are. Could you speculate on what it will take for all the protests to be successful? Um, will Netanyahu decide that he doesn't want to live with the protests anymore? Does some part of Likud decide to no longer support Netanyahu? What's going to happen? as a practical matter to make, to deal with this problem? Of course, I wish I knew. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, really, I'm saying that in these days, if you are, I, I'm a, a political scientist and a psychologist. I must say that it doesn't help me to understand this chaos any better than anyone else. I mean, sometimes when your uh, professional uh, knowledge doesn't help you to analyze reality, then you understand that all the, uh, that, that something is really uh, broken. But what I can say is that the turning protest, public um, civic protest, to a political power is one of the um, riddles of, uh, of political science. You can, I mean, there are only minor uh, or only few examples, like Lech Walesa in Poland, that had started as a as a protest uh, movement of workers, and then democratizes, and now we see the backlash. But uh, in Israel, in the history of Israel, of demonstrations in Israel. Um, on the one hand, we, we do have a legacy of demonstration that were a little bit uh, successful. For example, after the Yom Kippur War, even though the Agronat Commission that was uh, an inquir inquiry commission that said that the political uh, leaders, uh, Golda and Dayan, then, they do not c carry responsibility, they acted in a reasonable uh, way, even though there was a protest headed by, it started with a guy named Moti Ashkenazi, who was, um, 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 how do you say Miluim? Reserved. reserved. Was a reserved uh, uh, soldier. And it grew up, and at the end, Golda resigned. But the thing is that then the demonstration came from the base of the then uh, uh, Mapai. So it came from its own base. But now it's as if there's a abyss between the demonstrators and the government. They don't hear the crowds that shout democratia or us or what, what they shout in, in the demonstration. So I, I, it's really difficult to turn um, a really authentic uh, movement to a political power. Uh, so I think that the tiebreakers will be, as I said, the Arab uh, public. It might be few members of the Knesset from the Likud that will wake up and said we're not gonna, we don't want to be in the history books as those who gave their hands, like literally uh, voted for such, uh, for uh, these kind of laws that buried Israeli democracy. Um, and it might be uh, stronger, uh, more people that move to the center from the right, that see that 
uh, I don't know if it's by chance or not by chance, but this government doesn't work well. I mean, sometimes people like uh, Ben Gvir and Smotrich that are used to be against, that are used to be always on the opposition, that are used to be always um, uh, in uh, the peripheral of uh, uh, politics, when they get the power, so they think they will do whatever they want, and then they discover that it's not like that, fortunately. I mean, we now, and they don't act, I mean, in, as, a, as a, a ministers in a government, they don't show uh, any uh, successes. So this might bring to some uh, disappointment in the right uh, uh, wing voters. But actually, I really don't, I mean, your guesses are as good as mine. Maybe if you look at it from far, maybe you can see things that we, that we're in the middle, we cannot see. Well, look, if I can just follow up, um, in the prior administration, there was a lot of maneuvering going on to pull some of the supporters away from Bennett. So is there, can you, have any, is there any thought that there's some, there's some effort to try to pull some of the coup away from support Netanyahu? Uh, I, I, I don't understand, like, real uh, politics. I mean, I'm only an observer in this, so I, I, I don't know. So, Donna. And um, I think um, it may be your birthday, but you've actually given us a wonderful matana present today with your presentation. So, Yom uh, Thank you Thank for you. spending your birthday with us and for uh, really being one of our teachers today. So, thank you so much. Thank you, Laura.